الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله ونشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في القران المجيد والفرقان الحميد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سيقول السفهاء من الناس ما ولاهم ان قبلتهم التي كانوا عليها قل لله المشرق والمغرب يهدي من يشاء الى صراط مستقيم صدق الله العظيم وصدق رسول النبي الكريم اما بعد رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري وهلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي ما دي برادرز اند سيسترز ان اسلام السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وي ار ناو ستارتنج ذا سيكند داي اوف رمضان um i hope and pray that you're all well and doing well and practicing your salah and increasing your dhikr of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we did the first half almost the first half of uh, surah al-baqarah and today we will talk about the uh, a basic gist of the second half of surah al-baqarah and as i said last um um my talk uh, i was there at 9:30 yesterday that surah al-baqarah has many multiple topics contained in it and um just as in my juma khutbah i mentioned the definition that quran the, about the quran that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives hudal linnas it is guidance to mankind وبينات من الهدى and the guidance has been cleared has been clarified and reasons have been mentioned as to why such a such a ruling has been done for you and lastly it is a criterion it is a reference book for which you can always go and check what ruling is there for such a such a problem for example here there are multiple topics the first one which uh, just the ayah i recited where the problem of the qibla came where rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was praying in the first early days of the, uh, of his prophethood until he reached medina and he would um turn towards baitul maqdis and that was the qibla until he came to medina and it was the wish of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that he turn towards makka but the order had not come until finally the order comes and then they switch their qibla during salah to um uh, makkah and baitul haram for people this was a strange thing and even the ahli kitab and uh, the the kuffar started to mock rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that he his direction is not clear sometimes he points towards baitul maqdis and all of a sudden he has switched over and what kind of piety is this So Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala clarifies that piety is not turning towards the east or the west. To Allah belongs the east and the west. It is if there is real piety, Allah defines what piety is. Kama qaal laysa al-birra an tuwallu wujuhakum qibla al-mashriq wal maghrib. It is not piety that you turn towards the east or the west. Piety really is walakin al-birra man amana billah. Number 1 piety really means you believe in allah wal yawm al akhir and you believe in the day of judgment you believe in all the angels you believe in all the books that have been sent down you believe in all the prophets that have were sent by allah subhanahu wa taala you practice salah you give in charity your zakah you fulfill your promises wal mufuna bima ahadu was sabirin fil ba'sa wa al dara wa hina al ba's and that you practice patience when when challenging times come when there's a calamity or when times of war for example let us take the example of the syrian refugees because this is current day now those poor um refugees they they can ask why did allah do this to us 
How come the rest of the world doesn't have to, uh, to go through this problem? Why us? Why me, Allah? And the answer is, this is your test. And Allah wants to see how you bear this with patience. And that is bir, that is piety. And you fulfill your promises that you make, that is piety. Or let us say there's a death in the family and there'll be a question, why me? Why does it have to be that my parent or my son or my family member has to die? Why didn't this happen to somebody else? Allah tests each one of us in different ways. So that is the definition of piety. Then Rasulullah sallallahu was asked about certain things. For example, shirk in Islam is a big no-no. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is willing to forgive everything but shirk. Shirk cannot be on the table for forgiveness. And a question came up. During Hajj and Umrah, as part of the manasik, people would go and circumambulate, of course, the Kaaba. And in addition, as we all do, we go to Safa and Marwa and you do um, um, go around it. Now, on one side, idol worship is a big no-no. And questions started to come. Now, this Safa is a mountain. Marwa is a mountain. These are physical objects. And we're going around this. Is this shirk? That question comes up. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clarifies in Surah Al-Baqarah, that inna safa wal marwata min sha'airillah. Safa and marwa are among the signs from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there is nothing wrong for you that you go around the safa and marwa that you're doing because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told you to do so. So in Islam, there are certain things which are physical. Our prayers, for example, are not just purely spiritual in the sense that you can't just sit in a corner and say Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar and that becomes your Salah. Or that you recite all the, um, the recitation that you do in your Salah and you think that's, that, 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 that takes care of the Salah. No, you can't sit in a corner. There is a physical part to your worship and there is a spiritual part. And this needs to be clarified. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clarifies that. There are, in Surah Al-Baqarah, the manasik of Hajj. How do you perform Hajj? What is the sequence that you had to follow? Can you do business while you're doing Hajj? And yes, that is allowed. So uh, I, I can't go into the details. Uh, I, again, encourage you to read the Quran and um, the tafsir, and that will, uh, inshallah, help you with all the details of the manasik of Hajj. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clarifies the issues with women. For example, uh, a woman's monthly periods has been referenced and uh, has been mentioned that men stay away from the women during their monthly periods. The issue of divorce has been uh, addressed as to how, what is the process of divorce. And if, for example, if a man uh, has decided to divorce, there is an encouragement towards not doing it. And if you do decide to divorce, you, there is a cooling off period. Of, uh, and let us say the decision for divorce is done, then the woman has to restrain herself for three periods, three monthly cycles. Um, there are details. Let us say divorce does happen. And by the way, among all things halal, um, among all things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has permitted, the one that is most disliked is divorce. I wish I could spend a little more time on this because in today's day and age, divorce has become part of one's life. Divorce rates have reached 50% or more, which kind of suggests that marriage has lost its importance. That sanctity of marriage has been lost and it is time to spend, it's time to reflect on this as to what has gone wrong. Inshallah, that's a subject for another day. There are details. For example, let's say an actual divorce happens and the mother is, uh, has a baby that she's nursing. How are you going to um, hash it out? How is the baby being, going to be cared for? What is the responsibility of the husband who has divorced the wife? So on and so forth. The issue of orphans came up. How do you deal with orphans? What about the money or the inheritance that an orphan gets? All that details have been given. And there are stories. For example, there is the story of Bani Israel, 
and one story relates to our times because right now we are going through um, a calamity which is similar to what had happened hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, where plague was a common problem. And it was a calamity where people would leave villages because the entire village would end up dying. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about a group of people from among the Bani Israel. And as soon as the word came that plague has hit, they left their homes and ran away and there is a distinction here. They ran away because they were they feared death. And I want to stop here for a moment. We are going through a calamity. Now, when there is a calamity, you take precautions. Just as our Prophet ﷺ mentioned that you have a camel, you're going to tie it first and then trust in Allah. In the same way, when there's a calamity, you take precautions and you protect yourself. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa advised that when there is plague in a certain area, those people stay there. And people from outside don't go into the area where plague is, um, has become uh, endemic. And there is a lesson for us. But at any point in time, as a believer, you don't run away from the fear of death. Again, there's a distinction. You take precautions, but you're not afraid of death. Like, for example, let's say there is a doctor who has to go to work at the hospital. Let him take his precautions, but you don't resign and run away because, my God, I'm going to die. So here, there were these group of Bani Israel, and they were in the thousands. They, were, they feared death, and they ran away. And... Again, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in uh, more than one place that death you cannot escape. In, even if you are in a fort and you have protected yourself, if the time for your death has come, there's no way you can escape. And here these people ran away from death and Allah caused them to die. And all of them as a group died until a prophet comes and he makes dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And because of that dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised all of them. And there is a sign and a lesson for us. There is another story of the Bani Israel. And I, I wish I could go into more details, but I'll, 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 I'll try to touch upon this. I hope you can bear with me for a few more minutes. And this story, again, has some, some lessons for us because we are moving through similar situations. After the death of Musa والسلام, for the first 25 years, they were, um, they were guided by another prophet uh, during the time of Musa. And uh, I think the name was Joshua. And this, his rule lasted about 25 years. So you can take a similar time during the time of our Sahaba when these were the rightly guided caliphs who um, presided and tried to keep the Muslim ummah together and guided them towards the right path. After this, the downfall of the Bani Israel came. There was idol worship that slowly creeped in. They started to desert the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Basically, they forgot Allah, just as, as the Muslim ummah forgets their salah. We become weak. We forget our Fajr Salah and then our Zohar Salah and eventually Salah becomes just once in a while or maybe once every Juma. And this happened to the Bani Israel. And when that happens, that protection from Allah is lost. And because of which there were so many dictators who came and they ruled over them. And there were so many other uh, kings from outside. They came and they defeated the Bani Israel. And there is lesson here for us because we are going through a similar situation. And when the time to fight came, when these kings or tyrants came to fight, rather than putting their trust in their faith, they would take their most sacred relic. They had a relic and basically it was um, a tabut as the Quran describes. And in the tabut, there were certain physical objects. It is said that the asa of Musa, the stick of Musa, and there were certain objects that, which were possessions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
they would take those relics along with them to actually to the place where the war would take place, believing that if we have that relic behind us, we uh, will win this war. You know, when the, we can see that in a similar situation, I've heard of people who carry amulets, for example, thinking that this is this uh, will give you, uh, it's a special lucky charm. I'm going to hold on to this charm or my sheikh gave this charm. As long as I keep it, it'll be good for me. All good things will happen or I'm always going to be successful. No, your success, Allah decides. It is your faith in Allah your trust in Allah that will help you succeed in whatever you're doing. It is not those physical objects that you hold on to. So here, it so happened that they were in war and even that sacred relic that they were holding on to, they lost. And here, the, the Bani Israel are scattered all over. They've lost their homeland. And when they're scattered, they ask, the Prophet and the another unique thing of the Bani Israel was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had so many favors of them on them. They Allah sent them a book and after Musa alayhi salatu was salam, one after the other, a prophet would be raised for them. If one Nabi passes, another Nabi comes up and another and another Allah sent in succession one after the other. So they always had someone to guide them. So here, the people who are all scattered, they go and ask their prophet. And now they think, you know what? You know what's lacking? We don't have a king among us. Someone who can lead us back, that we can fight back and win. So they go and ask the prophet. And the prophet realized and could see the ills of the society. And he asked a question. All right, if Allah brings a king, appoints a king among you, are you ready to fight when the time comes? And they said, what do you mean? What do you mean we're not going to fight? We have, we have lost our lands, our children, our wives, the women have all been thrown out. And you don't think we're going to fight back and reclaim our land? As long as we have a king, of course we'll do it. You know, for a moment, I want to reflect on this. And some of us, let us say, have a lot of money or don't have money. And you wish, you know, if I had a million dollars, I'm going to give this in zakah. Or if I have such and such, I'm going to do this. Brother, don't ask. Do with what you have. Because you don't know if that money comes, you would really do it for the sake of Allah. We don't know. So whatever you have, work within your means. And here, their idea was, if there's a king, he'll be strong enough that we'll all fight. But Allah knew their own condition. And truly, when the time came, they all ran away, except for a small portion. So the Prophet, the Prophet at that time, he makes dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And finally, a king is appointed. Now, traditionally, the class in which the kings had uh, come among the Bani Israel was from a certain, uh, certain group of people. And this was the, the tribe of Judah. And all kings were pretty much from that tribe, from that um, uh, subset. And here, the Nabi appoints uh, from Bi'idnillah uh, a man called Talut. And in the biblical uh, tradition, the name used is Saul. So Talut was appointed as a king. Now Talut was not from that group of that cl upper class. So, and he was rather poor. And the people complained. Anna yakunu lahul mulku alayna. How come the kingship is given to him? Wa nahnu ahaqqu bil mulk. We were more deserving of being the king. And you, um, Allah gives kingship to that person. Wa lam yu'ta sa'atam min al mal. And he doesn't even have any money. He has no status. And you expect us to take him as a king? And the Prophet replies, Inna Allah qad ba'atha alaykum salut malika. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has decided that he is going to be the king. And there is a reason. Like I said, the Quran not only gives you a ruling, it also gives you reasoning behind it. 
there is a reason that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appointed this king and the reason was he was bestowed with two things one was jism he had physical strength and he had the ilm he had knowledge maybe the knowledge of warfare or maybe it was the knowledge of the deen so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had blessed him with the knowledge and with physical strength and the Prophet goes on to say, Inna ayata mulkihi fihi sakinatum wa baqiyatum imma taraka alu musa wa alu harunu tahmiluhul malaika. And a sign for you is that that tabut, the relic that you had lost, it is right now in the possession of the malaika. And it will come down and you will get it back. And miraculously, they get the relic back. And like I said, the relic contained the stick of Musa and other things that uh, belonged to the prophets. And this was a sign. And so Talut now collects everybody. And now they are on their way to fight. And on the way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests them. They, they pass through a river and Talut orders them and says, you are not going to drink from the water, from the river. Those of you who drink from the water, you're not going to join with me. And those of you who are not going to drink except a handful, a handful of water, you're allowed. But beyond that, you can't. So they move through the water. As they move, obviously, if you start drinking, nobody's going to watch you except Allah. And Allah says, فَشَرِبُوا مِنْهُ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا مِنْهُمْ And they drank from it except a small number. Now we need to pause here. Look, Allah sends a test. Sometimes it's a very simple thing as here. A drink of water is no big deal, but it is the obedience of Allah that Allah is watching. He wants to see who among you is really going to fear Allah bil ghayb, unseen. Like for example, you're fasting and you hold yourself from water, from drinking, from uh, slandering, from lying, you hold your tongue, you hold your eyes, you hold your nafs. Nobody is watching you except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likes and wants from you. In fact, that is why it is said, for every good act that you do, there is a reward, a prescribed reward, a certain amount that you're going to get as reward. But for fasting, because it is kind of unseen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, fasting is for me and I am going to specially compensate him on the day of judgment. Or so, uh, it is also mentioned that I am the jaza for him. And scholars say that this is the reward would be that on the day of judgment, they will be allowed to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through their naked eyes. And this is a gift that is like no other, to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself with your own naked eyes. So coming back to the story, so those of them who drank to their fill, now they become even more thirsty and more thirsty so that they end up staying there and they are unable to move along with Talut. And by the time they reach their destination, their place where the war is to take place, only a handful of people are left. And it is said that they were also in a similar number in the 300s, uh, compared, which is very similar to the number of people who were during the time of Badr, the Sahaba of the Prophet وسلم, at the time of Badr. And now they're facing an army many times bigger. And some of them commented, La al wa There is no way that we can win against this huge army. And the people of knowledge, they said, How many times has it not happened that a small group of people with the help of Allah have overcome a large group? So, and when they stand, they pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rabbana afrigh alayna sabran. O oh Allah, give us patience. Wa thabbit aqdamana. And let our hand, our, our feet stay firm. Wansurna ala al-qawm al-kafirin. Help us against the kuffar. And when they stand there, on the other side was Jalut. He was 
in full armor. Uh, uh, inshallah, we'll finish in the next uh, five to six minutes. Um, he was in full armor, armor of steel, so much that you could not defeat him. All the opening in his entire armor was on his eyes. Only his eyes were open. And Talut um, says to his people, who is there? He comes out. Jalut comes and challenges. He says, is there any one of you who can challenge me? And Talut stands up and says, is there someone who can face Jalut? And Dawood wasalam, at that time, he was also part of the army. And he, all these years, had perfected one thing. He had a sling. And he had perfected a good, his aim with a stone using a catapult. I'm sure you've seen uh, little boys play with their catapult. And he came, he stood up, and he promised that whoever fights and defeats Jalut, he will marry his daughter to him. And Dawood stands up to the challenge. He takes his catapult. All he takes needed was a small stone. And bi idnillah, with such force, he throws with the stone with his catapult that stone hits the man's eye. And it not only hits the eye, it goes all the way into his brain. And Jalut falls dead. And here there are thousands behind him, thinking that their number would save them. And they see that their king has fallen down dead, and they run away. And the victory at that time was for the Muslims. And here, my dear brothers, there is a sign. And Allah says, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had not removed uh, such tyrants, la fasadatil ard. There would have been fasad and mischief all over the earth. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intends to do fadl. For us, we need to return to him. We need to put all of our trust in him. And there are more topics in uh, Surah Al-Baqarah. Uh, for example, there is uh, the, the, um, um, the encouragement towards charity where um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes how he multiplies. You put, he gives the example of a grain of corn. You put the grain of corn in the, in the ground and it grows. And one grain produces hundreds and then thousands. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a similar way will grow your money when you give in charity. And the opposite has also been mentioned about riba, where people put money for the sake of making more profit, profit over money. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stops us and prohibits such an act of, um, of um, um, earning riba. Inshallah, that will be a topic for another day. And um, we'll finish with this dua, which is the last part of Surah Al-Baqarah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Amanar Rasulu bima unzila ilayhim min rabbihim. The prophets, they all believed, and the believers also believe in all the malaika, all the prophets, and um, the books, and um, everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent down. And whatever you do, whether you do it secretly or openly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching and he's aware of everything that you do. Even if you make dua silently, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, hears and knows what is in your heart. So let us make dua and close as this is the dua in the end of Surah Al-Baqarah. Rabbana la tu'akhidna in nasina aw akhta'na. O oh Allah, don't hold us to what we have forgotten or when we fall into error. Rabbana wa la tahmil alayna isran kama hamaltahu ala alladheena min qablina. O oh Allah, don't put a burden on us like the way previous nations were burdened. Rabbana wa la tuhammilna ma la taqata lana bih. O Allah, don't put a responsibility on us, something that we don't have the strength to carry. Rabbana wa gfir lana wa arhamna. O Allah, forgive us, have mercy on us. Wa arhamna wa anta maulana fansurna lal qawm al kafirin. O Allah, you are our protector. Help us against the, the, uh, the disbelievers. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he enlighten us from the verses of the Quran. He help us bring barakah in this glorious month. Uh, inshallah, we will uh, continue uh, tomorrow at 9.30. Aqul qawli haza wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa li sahab al-ajma'in.